Um, welcome back for the lab session. Um, today we have three parts. Um, the first part will be a direct continuation of last week. We will split this uh, lab in three. Um, the first part will deal with the direct continuation from last week. So we will continue based on a hugging face pre-trained model, build our own classification head on top of it and train this. Um, and we will see very quickly that these kind of training tasks get too much for these little laptop hardware things that we have all available. So we need to move this to, to a cluster computer um, to train there. And then the second part presented by Niklas will talk a bit about how to interact with cluster hardware. Um, and then the final part held by Yannick will uh, deal with Docker as sort of a continuation solution to ship all the, your needed dependencies and your code to the cluster to execute there. Um, as I said, we, we will continue from last week. Uh, last week was not really a code along session, but just rather a presentation of what's available in Hugging Face. So today will be more code along. We are a bit short on time, so there will be some instances where we'll just copy paste uh, between notebooks, uh, between the solution and the code notebook. So that's why the solution is already visible on the web page. So you can follow along in some parts, but I will try to incrementally build this with you. Um, yeah, so, so let's begin. Um, by request, we included all the dependencies as a top level cell. So if you don't have any of these packages installed right now, you can just uncomment the line and use pip to install them. Um, and the first thing we encounter is just a global configuration uh, lookup. So it holds the uh, name of the pre-trained model that we're going to use from the Hugging Face Hub. Then the sequence length, um, as you recall, we need to pad our sequences to the same length in all instances. Um, so today we deal with 512 tokens uh, or symbols in each sequence. Um, we began the semester working on our IMDB data, which was uh, sentiment classification. So we predict the score between zero and one. Um, today we will expand this a bit into multi-class classification. So we will work with the um, 20 news groups data set. And as the name suggests, we work with 20 different classes that we want to classify here. And uh, yeah, for training, we also need a batch size. So we chose 64. If that doesn't fit your hardware or doesn't fit the cluster hardware, we could also reduce this to uh, 32 or some other um, some other size of your choosing. Um, so let's first uh, import TensorFlow. Um, the lower part should look the same for you. You should have 2.8.0 installed because there are some API changes, I think, that will break the notebook if you don't have at least uh, 2.8. So 2.7 something uh, has some issues, I guess. Um, and this will just print whatever devices are on there. This will likely default to just the CPU in your case. So the first task is to obtain our data. Um, in the previous lab where we worked with the IMDB, we had a download link, uh, which we needed to manually download and extract. Um, luckily for us, the sklearn, or scikit-learn, as you would install it via pip, um, already provides us with the 20 news groups data um, in a structured format. So we can just uh, call this 20 news groups, uh, or fetch 20 news groups uh, call and do raw data. Um, equals fetch 20 news groups. And there are a couple of different options um, that we can supply here. The first one um, is called data home, which is just the path to where this function will save all the uh, information from this collection. I'll just point it to my local folder. Then we have the option to remove something. And what that means will become clear in a second as I can show you the data once I've downloaded this. Um, so 20 news groups is data from um, online discussion firms, so the uh, Usenet news groups. And they all have headers, footers, and quotes. If they kind of reply to something, the reply will be featured as a quote. And you can set custom headers and footers. But these will likely contain metadata that we can overfit on. So we try to remove them from the data. Um, and it comes with a predefined train test split, but in our case, we're just going to load all of the data and split it ourselves later. So this will take a second to, to download and uh, load all the data into memory, and then we can inspect what we have here. It will be a dictionary, and if I print it as a whole, I will see all the training examples, which will take up a lot of space. So I'm just going to print the keys of this dictionary. Um, we have the data, which is a list of our training uh, documents. Um, then the associated file names where all these training documents came from. 
We have target names, which is just a list of the different class labels that this data set contains. We have the target, which is the target label from 0 to 19, so 20 classes, and the description of the data set itself. What we are really interested in is the target names because we need to map our, um, our class names to an integer. So we will construct a class mapping. Uh, we can also very shortly have a look in here um, what the class names actually are. So target names. Um, and we have very different topics our news group postings can stem from. So we have some which deal with uh, computer graphics or uh, computation in general. Um, we have something on the science domain. We have some politics talk. Um, so we can wrap all this, uh, we can wrap this list into a dictionary that uh, gives us a class label by just enumerating it, so 0 to 20, and then uh, call dict on that, and that will give us the data structure that we wanted. So I will just save this as class mapping for later. Okay, um, the next step, as uh, we already saw, um, in the first uh, lab session is that we need to perform a train test split. So split our data up into different subsets for training, testing, and of course, validation. Um, so we can, once again, keeping to the sklearn convention of naming the input space with a capital X and the output space with a, a lowercase y. Um, this will correspond to the data entry in our original data. Um, and the output space is the so-called target entry, right, caps lock, uh, target entry, and these now hold all the data that we need to uh, perform a train test split on. Um, once again, we're using the train test split function as specified by sklearn. So we can first train, uh, split into train and test set, so x train and x test, and of course, y train and y test. This is nothing new. Use a train test split um, on the aforementioned x and y. And we want to have a test size of 10%. And just for reproducibility, because we will later ship this to the cluster and want to have the exact same split there, we will use a random state. Um, so the seed for our randomly generator, which shuffles all the data, we're just going to use 42. Now we have train and test split, uh, but we also want a validation split. So we are further going to split off a validation set from our uh, training set that we previously split it. So Y train and Y validation. And this is once again a train test split, but this time call it on the X train because we want to build a subset of the subset, so to say, um, and Y train. And now the test size, because we also want to have 10% of the original data um, for a validation set, um, this would end up being one ninth because the training set is nine tenths, and then one ninth of that is one tenth in the original um, of the original amount. And of course, the same random state uh, as previously supplied also applies here. So now we have our data in three different data sets, um, which uh, for us begins the purposes of pre-processing the data. So we have uh, we have strings right now. We want to transform them into yes, a question. Uh, yeah. No, we, we want to split off one ninth, which is just a validation data, and the X train will keep. Ah, yeah, that's an 80 10 10. That's perfectly. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so we now want to do pre processing, um, which means we need the tokenizer. Um, as Chris mentioned last week, we want to have the same tokenizer as the pre trained model um, was trained on. So we can just import it from the um, from the hacking case hub. We can do tokenizer equals, and we're just going to use the distilbert tokenizer. We're working with the distilbert model today, which uh, should be small enough to fit on a laptop and also on limited cluster resources. Um, and we can call from pre-trained, wait, there's a typo, pre-trained, and, um, Going back to the config object, we have a model name here, and we can just uh, use that. So call it on config uh, model. And this will load the distilbert base uncased, so no lower uppercase English language uh, from the hugging face up. 
Um, so this is our tokenizer. Uh, wait, I didn't run this cell, I think. Config, yes. It will take a while because it needs to download all the data, um, but now it's finished. And we can now apply this tokenizer to our sequence data to get the tokenized uh, version. Um, we need to do this process once for the train, one for the test, once for the validation data. Um, so instead of uh, reiterating on all the different keywords, I'm just going to put a temporary uh, tokenizer config dictionary, which is just the arguments to the tokenizer function that we don't want to modify, just so we don't have to um, have to write them out over and over again. So the first thing is that I want to uh, return TensorFlow tensors. So return tensors equals TF. We also want to return the attention mask. And what the attention mask actually is will become clear in the lecture of uh, on transformers. Um, so for now, just accept that it's there. Um, and of course, we want our uh, token IDs. So we want the actual numbers that make up our tokens. Um, set this to true. Um, as explained in the first session, we need padding, and we want to pad to the maximum sequence length. Um, in case there are any sentences in our training data that exceed this length, we also want to just truncate them. So we cut them off at the maxim maximum allowable length. Um, in the first session, we could just freely expand until all the different sequences fit in there. Uh, we can't do that here because the BERT model was trained on 512 tokens. And if we feed something, we can't feed anything into it that's longer than 512 tokens. So we need to cut off anything that is. And of course, we need to specify this maximum length of 212 tokens. And we have this in our config object as the sequence length. Um, so now I can very cleanly call uh, the tokenizer on um, on my x train, x test, and x validation. So first, I will write them into a new variable token tokenized, and um, instead of feeding it one by one uh, as you would do in a in a map operation, we can just use the built-in map operation of the tokenizer, which is called batch encode plus which encodes a batch. I'm not sure what the plus stands for, but I'm just going to accept it. Um, so X train and our tokenizer config that we defined up here. So these uh, double asterisks, if, in case you're not experienced, as experienced in Python, will just unpack this dictionary as uh, arguments to our function call. And we can do the exact same thing on the train and test set. So X test tokenized and X validation tokenized. Oop. Okay, that's an error. I think I have, ah, yeah, there's a typo in here. This should be called return token type IDs, not token IDs. Um, and this should run cleanly. It will take a, about a minute, I think, um, to uh, transform all our data. So this will be a good time for questions, yes. Um, I have the solution on the right here, um, but you could look it up in the Hugging Face uh, documentation. So all the, basically everything we import uh, is either from transformers, um, from the Hugging Face library transformers or from TensorFlow directly. So the TensorFlow documentation is, I think, known. The Hugging Face documentation you can just find on huggingface.com and then um, there should be transformers stock over here. And if we do distill bird, this, will give us the distilled thing and it's grouped by models. So if you have the distilled object, just the tokenizer, the model and all the config stuff is in this large documentation over here. Okay, yeah, um, the tokenization finished. Um, so now we have a list of sequences of, of TensorFlow tensors. Now we need to turn that into a proper TensorFlow data set um, so that we can uh, train our model on it. 
before we do that, I want to point out one very quick thing, and I'm just going to copy this cryptic print statement over. Um, or I, I will explain what it does. So if we investigate what the X train tokenized contains, um, it now has, has an entry input IDs, uh, which corresponds to these token target IDs over here. Um, and then we have the attention mask, which is also a matrix of attention masks. Um, and as you may notice, the first entry of all these input IDs, so the first token in our sequence, this is always the same. Um, and we can have a quick look at what this special word is. Um, if we convert our IDs back to the original, um, or not the original, but rather to, to the tokenized version um, of actual string data, we can see that we have this uh, CLS token, which is inserted by the tokenizer in the first place, which is a special token. Everything that is in these square brackets is a special token. Also this uh, padding character at the end, which we just used to fill up. Um, and also you can see as last week, we have these subword uh, tokenization going on here. Um, so the CLS token is just the first token in every sequence that you feed into a distilled model. And the, um, the hidden representation, so the internal representation of the CLS token in the model itself um, is the sentence or sequence embedding that we will later use for our model to train on. Um, so just keep in mind that this is always the first token in every sequence, and we'll come back to this uh, in, in a bit. Um, so we will turn this into a, a TensorFlow data set, so the training data set, tf.data.data set. The method is called from tensor, tensor slices um, because the tokenizer gives us slices of tensors in a large matrix. Um, and we can, uh, we need to pair this up with, uh, with the labels again. So we will put in the X train tokenized and the Y train. Ah, okay. Thank you for pointing this out. Yes. In the slices, and the exact same thing for the test and for the validation. Uh, so test, validation, test, and validation. Now it's a TensorFlow data set. Um, we can quickly investigate what this means. Um, and I'm once again copying it over instead of typing it out because it saves time. Um, so we now have a data set spec that includes, uh, you can think of it as columns. We once again have the input IDs, um, we have the attention mask, but also this, uh, this output, um, wait, this one over here, um, this output column, which is the label that we're going to predict. Okay, um, one thing remains, and that is to uh, shuffle and batch our data to feed into the model later. So we have our batched train data set, uh, which is the train data set. We're going to shuffle it to get some random order in. And this is uh, what Niklas explained two weeks or three weeks ago, because of these two, um, in our introduction to TensorFlow um, data sets. As, as the size of the uh, shuffle, Buffer, I think it's called, uh, we're going to do two times the batch size. And then we will infinitely repeat the data. Again, what all of these different calls do, refer back to Nicholas lecture on this. And finally call the batch operation to split it up into uh, evenly sized batches, uh, batch size. Yep, this should be trained, yes. And we can do the, well, not the same thing because we're not going to shuffle and repeat the data, but a similar thing is done to, uh, or the batching at least is done to the test and validation data as well. So we have our test data set and our test data set over here. Hmm? Ah. Sorry, yeah, validation. <laughs> um, and there is another typo. Ah, yeah, there's a T over there, and now it works out. Okay, now we have uh, batches of tensors in the input and output space, um, and we are ready to build the model on top of that. 
Um, so the first thing, as last week, is to import the pre-trained model from the TensorFlow Hub, uh, uh, not the Tensor, the Hugging Face Hub, not the TensorFlow Hub, which is a different thing, but similar. Um, so I'm just going to name it transformer, and we want the distilbert model. This TF prefix is just that it's a TensorFlow version. You can also get a PyTorch or a JAX or Rust implementations, I think, of the same model. But for our cases, we work inside TensorFlow. So distilbert model. And <laughs> once again, we are going to initialize it from pre-trained. OK, so we, we have our pre-trained model. Now we just need to feed data into it. Um, and the data set now has the secret, the, um, the token IDs and also this attention mask. So it needs two kind of input layers um, so we can uh, combine them and feed them into the transformer model. So um, we construct an input ID layer, which is a Keras input layer. Um, so TF Keras layer input. Um, it, it, of course, has a shape. Um, which in our case is the maximum sequence, sequence length. Um, length like this. Um, and then we will name it. Um, the TensorFlow data set has these name columns. So the input layer needs to correspond to name to whatever uh, this input layer should attend to. Um, so the first thing is the input IDs column. And the data type is 32-bit uh, integers. We need a similar input for the uh, attention masks. So we can just copy this over and rename it, attention mask. And of course, it, this should be attentive to the attention column in our tokenized data. Uh, layers. Yes, layers. Um, and we can call the transformer um, on these input layers. So transformer and the input IDs will be our input IDs uh, uh, input layer. And the attention mask to the transformer is supplied by, well, uh, the attention mask input layer. Um, and this transformer will now give us a very huge matrix um, where every single, so it's, can we check, can we check the shape of the output? I think only later, uh, maybe that will clear it up a bit. Nah. Mm, okay, um, so the, Transformer builds an internal representation for every single token in our input sequence, but we also we only want the last hidden state of our um, CLS token that I talked about previously, the first token in every sequence that holds the kind of embedding that we want. Um, so we can extract this by first using the last hidden state, which is just the last most state of the transformer. Um, using the last hidden state attribute of this, right? Yeah, so well. that you can the ah, yeah, and I can maybe call this, yes. Um, so this is uh, the batch size, so it comes in batches. And we can see that we have this 512, which corresponds to our maximum sequence length, and then the 768, which is the internal size of the um, transformer representation of the sequence, uh, of, of every embedding size um, of this token in the sequence. Um, and we now only want the first of these 512 tokens because that's the CLS embedding that we are trying to, to get. Um, so we can just use multidimensional indexing. Uh, so I will save it into a new variable to clear up some confusion. Um, so the, we want this to be just as is because this is a batch size. We don't want to modify that. We want the zero index of the uh, first dimension and of the second dimension, we want uh, just to have everything again because we need the uh, full embedding produced by the um, transformer. Okay, so now we have the output of our pre-trained model um, that we can now build our classification hat upon. Um, so we 
as in the first session of the lab, we will define um, um, Kira's model. Um, we will use a slightly different syntax because it's easier to write if we use complex inputs and outputs. So um, the first layer after our transformer will be a dropout layer to help with regularization. And we will just put 0 0.02 and this, uh, so 20% of the input data is set to zero randomly. Um, and we will call this on the uh, CLS token um, that we extracted from the transformer embedding. And then we will add to this uh, stack of layers by um, the first thing will be another dense layer. And once again, you can play around with these values, but I will use 128 dimensions for now. And we will use a real activation function. And this is the different syntax to the sequential syntax that we saw in the first lab session. We would just call it on its previous state. So we just nest all these layers into each other. So call one on the output of the former. Um, and we will just to build a bit more complex model that can generalize hopefully better, add another uh, dropout and add another dense layer, this time with a little bit uh, of a reduction in size. And uh, then we will use an output layer. And the output layer should have the name, same number of dimensions um, as uh, classes that we want to predict because it will be a softmax activation. So we have, as Ben explained, for each of our classes, a pseudo probability um, that we can use to uh, compute our loss. So the dimensions here, which uh, should be the number of classes, which we had in our conflict dictionary, and the activation needs to be a softmax. Um, and this will, of course, decode on the uh, model that we defined previously. Uh, okay, there's the layers missing, and this continues down, so, yep, layers, perfect. Um, we now have our model structure, so we can turn it into a proper model by calling uh, Keras model on it, so tf model takes two inputs, our IDs, and um, our attention mask, and has the output layer as an output. And now we have a Keras model that we can train, which already includes, because this kind of encapsulates the transformer, this already includes our transformer layer defined previously. Um, however, for our fine tuning task here, because we are on limited hardware and because it works well out of the box, we don't actually want to retrain the complete transformer that we imported here. We only want to, um, to train these five layers that we now defined on top of the transformer. So we needed to set the um, pre-trained layer, the transformer layer, to not trainable. So the model will not try to um, modify the weights in this transformer in any way. Um, we can do that by calling model.getLayer, which will give us the layer um, by name. Um, so it takes an argument with the name of the layer. In our case, it will be TF distributed model because that's the layer name that Hagenface gave this kind of uh, uh, yeah, pre-trained model and then set trainable to false. And finally, we can inspect if our model or how our model is structured by calling a summary on it. And if we set, wait. Oh, okay. Apparently it's under a different name, so we'll first show the summary and see what it's named at. So this will be the name. It looks a bit funky now because the window is so narrow where I can expand it a bit, but I will have to shrunk it down later again. Um, so, ah, okay, there was some character missing. Um, yeah, so now we see this extra column named trainable, which will indicate if each of these layers is trainable by the uh, by calling fit or not. And as you can see, the uh, the distilled model that we imported, which makes up the majority of our parameters. So these are about six bill million or billion, 
66 million parameters would take forever to fine tune. So we're just not bothering with that. We only train the about 100,000 parameters that we added on top of that. Okay, back to the narrow form. Um, we have the model defined. We have uh, we inspected it and see that we actually train the things we want to train, so we can now compile it um, by calling model.compile. Um, model.compile. And as in the first session, we need a loss function, which is the uh, categorical cross entropy wait, that Benno mentioned, but didn't get to explain anymore. Um, it basically compares your predictions to the actual ground truth and then computes the loss based on that. So sparse, wait, let me copy this over, sparse categorical cross entropy. Yep. Um, and this is the default value, so it will default to false. I will just explicitly mention it here um, because we have, Niklas, correct me on this if I'm, if I'm wrong. We did apply softmax, we? we? did apply softmax, yes. Yeah, then, then we can, we actually have logic, so we can set this to proper true, actually. Um, so we save on, again, computing. Ah, okay, yeah. So, so the point of calling this is that we have a softmax activation in our last layer right here. Um, so the uh, the loss function does not need to convert our predictions into softmax probabilities, um, and we can just skip that step. Then the optimizer that uh, it's the same that we used in the first session. That we just default to using Adam uh, optimizers Adam, and we want to monitor the accuracy um, of our model. Accuracy, right. Uh, yeah, there's a comma missing right there. So now it's compiled. Um, before we start fitting it, um, or try to start fitting it, we will uh, use the same model checkpoints as in the first session. We want to save it after each training epoch to keep track of the progress or to, to default back to the progress if for some reason our training stops before it's finished. Um, so we have a model checkpoint. To call back um, callbacks that model checkpoint. And uh, as before, this needs the file pass to save the model under. I would call it fine tuned bird, fine tuned bird, 20 news groups, and then the HDF5 ending. Um, and uh, an optional option is to only save the uh, best version of the model. So it will only overwrite the model that we already have on disk if we actually got better in terms of the metrics we defined, which in our case is accuracy. So this will persist the model to disk. Um, we also don't want to keep training forever if there's no point. So we once again use the early stopping callback. Early stop. Um, so we can define a patience, uh, which means how many iterations do we want to keep trying if we don't have any, uh, if you don't exceed the previous uh, accuracy. So we can just do three, um, which will then keep training for three more epochs uh, if we didn't match a previous value. Um, we can monitor the validation loss. Um, we want a minimum delta, so how much is it allowed to move until we say, okay, it's not changing anymore? Um, you can put 0 0.01 there. Um, mode equals min, so we want to stop when the monitored quantities of validation loss has stopped decreasing. Um, uh, so min and max just means in which direction do we want to monitor our metric. And because the loss keeps decreasing, we search for the minimum. Um, if we were to monitor the validation accuracy, we would need to call max here because the accuracy, hopefully at least, keeps increasing. Um, and, well, we don't need the verbose thing anyway, so we can just skip that. Um, and after the short introduction of TensorBoard in the previous sessions, we also want, of course, the uh, 
TensorBoard callback to save our logs. Um, so call x dot tensor oh, wait it's capitalized so tensor board um, one thing that will um, you will need on the cluster is to specify a log direction so you know where you actually can get your logs from later on so i'll just save it to the local directory called logs okay uh, these are our callbacks and we can now fit the model um, so we call model.fit. Uh, we call it on our batched training data. So train data set. Uh, our validation data is the batched validation data set. We want to train, let's say, 10 epochs. We will not train, as will become clear in a second, because it's much too large of a model to train on a laptop. But, um, and we want to uh, specify how many steps, so how many, um, yeah, how many steps we want to do per epoch. And if you recall, we called the um, we called repeat on here up here, um, which will just infinitely loop our data set. Um, so we need to the steps per epoch argument to define when an epoch actually ends, because if you have an infinite data set. And the implicit definition of an epoch is I've seen every training sample once. If we have an unlimited number of training samples, we just keep continuing to train. So we tell it how many steps can you take until you consider this epoch done. Um, and this will just be the length of our training data uh, divided um, by our batch size. Um, because the number and like a batch size number of documents is fed in the model at the same time and that's a step and we want to do that until we have the length of the training set and so we need to divide it. Okay, uh, and the callbacks in our case are the ones we defined up here so model checkpoint, early stopping and tensor board. Okay, um, and we can we will try in a second. Ah, okay, validation data, I think it's called. Yes. Um, huh. Okay, we made an, an error somewhere in our batching of the training and test data, uh, which is up here. So let me check what we did wrong or what I did wrong. With the batch size over here. This looks correct at least. Huh. Interesting. Because the um I don't want to spend that much time on investigating the issue here because the solution notebook will definitely work. <laughs> so if you just copy over uh, from the solution, it will hopefully at least end up fine. Um, we don't need this fit call anyways, because on most computers, it will just print an estimated time of, I don't know, 30 hours or something to fit one epoch. Um, and so that's way too long to, to fit it on here. Um, and the point I was trying to illustrate by just calling fit is to show you this timestamp. Um, so this creates a need for us to take our model and ship it to a cluster because it will not take 30 hours, but I don't know, three minutes or something to fit a single epoch there because you have access to the, uh, to the compute hardware. Um, to continue with the notebook, because we of course want to see uh, what, what the model actually looks like, um, we actually fitted this model in, of the solution of this exercise. Um, and you can just download it. Um, it's hosted under, if you don't have curl on your system, you can also manually download it um, by going to files.vibus.de uh, and I found the folder uh, BDLT, so big data and language technologies. And in there, there's this HDF5 model. And this is just the link that's also in this curl statement. Um, I already have this download over here. Um, and we want to load this model. And there's some peculiar things about loading something that has been trained with a pre-trained model. So we're not the complete computation graph is defined by you inside your, um, your training process. So 
we can use the keras.models.load model function and uh, use the file name that we save this under, which will be, if you execute the curse statement, this one. Um, if we just try this, it will complain that it can't find the layer type TF distilled model because it doesn't know about our pre trained model. It's not encoded in the saved uh, version. So whenever you fine tune something and want to load it later, and that's the point we had, it's the last thing in this notebook that we want to illustrate because before we ship the whole training process to the cluster, is that you have this custom object statement over here, and you can define a dictionary with where you basically tell TensorFlow or, or tell Keras, okay, this object in the computation graph corresponds to this Python object, and you can just use that to construct the model. Um, so it complains about this uh, TF distilled model that it doesn't know. Um, so we can just tell it, okay, that's the TF distilled model that we imported from Hugging Face. And then uh, we have the model. You can, if you only load the model to evaluate it, you can ignore this warning. Um, if you use it, if you want to continue training at some point, um, so it, it complains that it can't load the state of the optimizer. And as you might recall from, from the lecture from previous labs, that the optimizer will adapt to the training. So as further as the training goes, the, the is it called step size? The step size of the optimizer will get smaller and smaller because it doesn't want to overshoot a solution that it might have found. Um, but if we load it from disk like here, the optimizer will be in its original state again. So if you continue training, you will just have the largest step size at the beginning of the training and maybe overshoot a solution that it already found. Um, so if you want to save a model for training, uh, you should definitely save the optimizer state with it. It should just be an argument to the um, save method uh, that you use up here. We only want to use it for inference, so that's fine. We can ignore the warning. Um, and the last thing I want to do is to evaluate our model. So we have, uh, I think it's called batch test data set. Uh, okay, and it will run into the same error because our data is somewhat funky. Um, yeah, um, so we just forgot this little dot data at the end, uh, which will actually take the data, not the container around the data, um, and write into our tokenized uh, variable. And once we append this data and run all the rest of the notebook again, um, our fitting works out. And as you can see, the and this laptop has a GPU in it, and even then the uh, estimated fitting time for one single epoch is half an hour. If you only have a CPU, it will just continue to grow in time. Um, and now also the evaluation works. So the pre-trained model that we uploaded, which is about uh, 0.64 accuracy, which is not terribly great, but we're not going for the state of the art here. Um, what is the random accuracy? Hmm? The random uh, yeah, so the, the random accuracy, if you would just assign any of the 20 classes, of course, one by 20, so 0 0.05. So we are definitely better than random, uh, much better, in fact. Um, I guess the state of the art is somewhere around 0.89 last I checked. So it's a decent solution, which you can just build by adding five layers on top of an existing model. And that's all we yeah, wanted to illustrate. Um, ah, yeah. One last thing, because we need that uh, for shipping it to the cluster. So far, we did this lab in Jupyter Notebooks, um, but you can't access Jupyter if it's running on the cluster because the cluster just takes your job, execute it, and it's done. So it's not interactive in any way. Um, so you need to convert whatever you did in a notebook on your local machine to a script that you can then execute on the cluster. You could do that manually by copy-pasting all your Python code cell by cell into a new file. Um, there's a shortcut, which we just want to illustrate here. There's this uh, NB convert tool which will automatically take a notebook and then output a Python file for you. Um, so if you just call this cell, wait, I need to uncomment it, of course, um, this will convert it to Python and takes our current uh, notebook as input. So we have now um, this py file over here, and we can quickly have a look into it. This is just the notebook that we just wrote, but in a form that you can just execute it on the cluster. Um, so yeah, keep this very short handy trick of MB convert in mind. 
One last thing, if you have any IPython magic statements in your notebook. Um, so things like uh, these exclamation mark shell thingies or something that starts with time or any these kind of special Jupyter things, um, you should remove them first because they will be translated into the Python script, but since they are not in a Jupyter environment, they will not work in a Python script. So get rid of them before converting, um, just as a heads up. Okay, we now have this uh, Python file, which should work on the cluster. And Nicholas will tell you more about how to actually do that. <laughs> 